Hello friends. This is Muse Fanfictions. How are you all? So in this video, we will see what if Naruto had plant release. The summary says. Naruto is take from the village to be trained by a member of the Uzumaki family. Plant release Naruto. But before we start, if you want more stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe and like this video, and if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. Naruto was having an okay day, for his birthday. He woke up in his apartment to find a gift from the Sandame Hokage. It had been a small potted fern. It had many different colors running through the leaves from green to a very exotic violet. He set it with his other three plants, which consisted of a bonsai cherry tree, a mini rose bush, and a small belladonna flower. The Sandame had explained how to care for them each, and in the case of the belladonna that since it was highly poisonous that it had to be handled with care. Naruto could happily say that he was head over heels in love with the plants. They were his friends and confident and never treated him mean. They also never treated him nice but he didn't mind. He watered them and set them in the windowsill to get sunlight before he walked from his apartment. He made his way to Ichiraku ramen stand to get some breakfast. After three bowls, which was all he had money for, he made his way to a small enclosed meadow. It was known as training ground four which meant that very few people ever came to it as 4 was an omen for death. Naruto however didn't see any problem as 4 was just a number to him. The training ground had a single taijutsu post as well as a few shuriken and kanai targets. Naruto however liked it because it had long soft grass to lay in beside a crystal clear pond filled with aquatic plants. There was a large gnarled old willow hanging out into the pond, and the whole area was ringed in with trees. All in all the place was a paradise. As Naruto began to kick the post like Gigi, the Sandame, showed him he felt he was being watched. He spun around to see a small fox kit watching him. It was soft and fluffy and most importantly, orange. So pretty. Naruto mumbled as he gazed at the kit. He made to walk over but the kit bolted back five feet away. Naruto got slightly discouraged by this and called out. Wait. Please don't leave I won't hurt you. The fox sat down at the distance he was currently at and watched Naruto with his head cocked sideways. Naruto flopped down and returned the fox's gaze. They sat like that for a few minutes until Naruto saw the fox move closer. Thinking this was a good sign Naruto also moved closer. It went like this until Naruto was able to tentatively reach out and stroke the kit's soft fur. Naruto beamed with happiness when he heard what sounded like purring. Naruto continued to pet the fox until his stomach began to grumble. He then got up to leave and said. Bye bye fox chan thanks for playing with me. Before walking away from the training ground, he was very surprised when he noticed the kit following him away. Do you want to come with me fox chan? He asked in surprise as the fox seemed to be wait ng for Naruto to pick him up. Naruto reached down and picked up the fox. Then he laughed as it proceeded to snuggle into his arms. He grinned and began walking towards the Hokage's office. He hadn't made it halfway there when he heard a person say. Look the demon brat has a pet. And it's a damned fox. Naruto backed away from the rather large man who was pointing at him, before he heard. Not enough that he has to walk around after what he did but now he's mocking us too. Naruto continued to back away from these people until he heard those hateful words. Get, M. Naruto turned and ran. Clutched the tiny fox like it was a life buoy he ran as fast as his six-year-old legs could carry him. There was a large mob after him, and they all wanted blood. Standing in the Hokage's office, with a look of utmost impatience, was a tall bald man with a large scar on his face going from left to right across the bridge of his nose. He wore a stereotypical set of monk robes, as well as a pair of Geta sandals. He carried large scrolls strapped to the small of his back, and carried a large cannibo over his right shoulder. He exuded a presence of pure power. Much like the man behind the desk. The Sandame Hokage sat behind his desk glaring daggers at the man in front of him. I have given you my word on this matter Arhat. The Sandame said with a voice so full of authority it caused the hidden Anbu to quake in fear. Then let me give you mine Hirazan, he is my great grand nephew. I don't care if I have to bring your village to its knees he will be coming with me to be trained to be a true Uzumaki. The man said in a voice so cold that it seemed ice would begin to form at any second. Now I have said I would bring him and any others I found back here as well as bringing the Uzumaki into the village hidden in the leaves, 
but I will train him to be the proper clan heir he was always meant to be. But know this if you force my hand I can and will destroy your village to take my kin with me. Hiruzen gazed at Arhat Uzumaki with a look of rage before he sighed. Can't you wait and train him later in life or possible train him here? Hiruzen I am a 90 year old shinobi. I am powerful and I am dangerous, but I am slowing down. I can feel my age catching up with me. I need to train him to be a proper Uzumaki before I have to retire from actively putting myself in danger. I fully expect least but I court to live another 30 years but he must be trained in the ways of his ancestors, also I plan on trying to find any others. Arhat said with a sigh. But the boy will have to come with me. You realize that what you ask will be near impossible right? Hiruzen said with a sigh. As the Kayubi Jinchuritsuki he isn't to be outside the village unless on a ninja mission. Simple fix. The Uzumaki were given free roam status by the Shodem Hokage at the very beginning of the village. It's in the charter. Arhat said with a smirk. He is free to leave at any time he was to so choose. Hiruzen shook his head and started to say something when an Anbu burst into the room and bowed before the desk. Hokage-sama there has been an attack. Speak. The Hokage commanded only to wish he hadn't a second later. Uzumaki Naruto was attacked by a mob on his way here. The Anbu stated before he was floored by the combined killing intent of Hiruzen Serutobi and Arhat Uzumaki. Where are the people responsible? Hiruzen asked in a deathly quiet voice. They are being held under a mass genjutsu by Weasel. The Anbu managed to get out without stuttering. Where is the child? Arhat asked his voice as hard as steel. Currently in ICU, along with a tiny fox kit that he seemed to be protecting. The Anbu stated getting really scared between the two cage level shinobi. Take us there now. The Hokage hissed angrily. The Anbu nodded to rapidly the Shun Shin the two legendary shinobi away. After the three disappeared the four hidden Anbu let out a sigh of relief. The trio arrived in Naruto's private hospital room. Arhat quickly did a diagnostic jutsu to see how he was. He was surprised to see the minor cuts, scrapes, and bruises heal before his eyes. He also noticed that the major wounds such as fractured ribs and a broken femur were healing at an unnaturally high level, even by Uzumaki standards. He'll be healed completely by tomorrow at this rate. Arhat said in awe of the speed of healing. Then if you feel it is safe to move him I want you to go tonight, before the council gets word of this and tries to stonewall you. I will have all of his belongings sealed up and brought here within the hour. The Sandame said before turning to leave. Please I realize I have failed him, but he's my sensei's son the last one in the world able to carry sensei's legacy. Please keep him safe. The Anbu said before leaving the room also. Arhat gazed down at the boy before he began using the Mystic Palms Jutsu to speed up the healing on Naruto's ribs. He continued this for a total of two hours before he picked up the sealing scroll of Naruto's possessions and then the boy who was still clutching the small fox, and left the hospital. He made his way north to the main gate and walked right by the sleeping Chunin at the gate without looking back. It would be six years before anyone would see them again. Deep in the recesses of Naruto's mind rested the greatest biju. The Kayubi was contemplating his host. Naruto had no fangs or claws. He had very little muscle. As well as lacking in the academic department. But he had proven without a shadow of a doubt that he was unflinchingly loyal. Kayubi had watched the villagers, weak pathetic wretches that they were, beat berate and abuse the child all of his life. Frankly Kayubi found it repulsive to think he was anywhere near such creatures. But then there was the bright light of humanity that was Naruto. He took everything life threw at him and continued on with that false smile of his. Kayubi just didn't understand how he did it without losing all semblance of sanity. Kayubi watched as Naruto was beaten and bruised by this herd of human monsters who called for Kayubi's own death but came no closer to it. Finally it was over and Kayubi gazed at the world through the eyes of a broken upset young boy. Feeling pity he drew Naruto's conscience into his presence. Wake up kit we have much to talk about. Kayubi said to unconscious form of Naruto. Naruto woke up in what appeared to be a sewer if front of a huge cell door. He looked through the bars to see a pair of eyes as big as he was. His eyes widened in fear. Who are you? Naruto asked fearfully. I am the Kayubi no Kitsune. Greatest of the nine biju and currently sealed in you. The colossal fox said stepping into the light to show Naruto his form. 
Aren't you supposed to be dead? Naruto asked perplexed by the sudden appearance of a supposedly dead chakra demon. Supposed to be dead? No it has been said that your father killed me but no he sealed me into your gut. The fox said with a smirk. My father? Naruto questioned uncertainly. Yes your father the Yandaimi Hokage. The Kayubi said with a huff. The Yandaimi was my dad? Naruto asked in amazement. Yes he was in fact your father. The Kayubi said with a frown. Is that truly so hard to believe? You look like a mini clone of the bastard. How do you know I was his son? Naruto asked suspiciously. B-E-C-A-U-S-E-Y-O-U-R mother was my last host so I was there for the whole thing. From her childhood to your birth. That was before the bastard Madara Uchiha ripped me from her seal and caused me to attack the hidden leaf village. The Kayubi said with a huff. But we are getting off topic. You have shown that you are extremely loyal so I offer you a gift. Because you risked your life for the kit I'm going to give the kit some of my chakra. Not enough to turn it to a demon mind you, but enough that it will be able to fight beside you and perhaps speak your language. Naruto gaped at the huge chakra beast. Are you sure you're a demon? You're being awfully nice. Kayubi gazed at Naruto with a deadpanned expression. And just what do you know about D-E-M-O-N-K-I-N-D exactly? Um, nothing? Naruto said chuckling nervously while scratching the back of his head. Remember that before you make assumptions. Now as I was saying. I have given the kit some of my chakra to grow and be useful to you. Now I have a deal for you if you will accept. The Kayubi said before pausing to let Naruto speak. What kind of deal? Naruto asked his face scrunched up in thought. I will give you a K-E-K-K-E-I Jenke in return for you one day releasing me from this seal. Kayubi said and allowed this to sink in. Naruto thought about that for a moment. The only Keke Jenke covered in the academy so far was Mokaton. Does that mean I could have Mokaton? If that is what you wish I will give you the closest thing I can. Kayubi said after a long pause. Does that mean you will grant me my freedom when you are able? If you promise not to try to destroy the leaf again, Naruto said at length. Then prepare yourself because this is going to be UNPLESENT, the Kayubi said before a flood of red chakra poured out of the cage and surrounded Naruto. Arhat had been carrying Naruto through the trees of the Fire Nation for the past five hours. That is, until he saw the burst of red chakra leave Naruto and enter the fox kit. He then quickly landed on the ground and set the boy down. He watched with worry as the red chakra soon enveloped the boy as well. Both whimpered in pain. Arhat gritted his teeth as his grandnephew whimpered in pain while writhing on the ground for the next hour. He hated the helpless feeling he got from the whole situation. However eventually he notices the red chakra recede into the seal on the boy's stomach. Gradually Naruto woke up and gazed at his surroundings. Naruto quickly began to panic. Calm down Naruto you're safe now. Arhat said in a soft soothing voice. Arhat offered a canteen to the boy. Naruto cautiously took it before asking. Who are you Gramps? Arhat burst out laughing. Yep you're definitely an Uzumaki. We're the only people on earth that disrespectful. But to answer your question I am your great grand uncle Arhat Uzumaki. Where are we? Naruto asked gazing at his surroundings. Well we are five hours north of Konoha. Arhat said after some contemplation. Why are we here? Naruto asked cocking his head to the side. Well because I am going to be training you. We're going to go to the village hidden in the grass to get your cousin Karen and then I'm going to train you both. Arhat said kind of dumbly. Well then let's go. Naruto said standing up. Arhat nodded and picked the boy up and jumped into the trees before leaping away towards the north. It had been three days since they left Konoha and Arhat had been watching Naruto and the fox kit very closely. Since the red chakra had enveloped the duo, they had seemed to get a lot closer. Sometimes it seemed as if they could understand each other. Of course Arhat didn't know the extent of the possible side effects of such exposure to a Biju's chakra but he was still leery. There was also that he didn't know if the boy even knew about the Kayubi yet so in his mind best not even bring it up until they were in a safe place. Naruto for his part was having the time of his life. They were currently camped five miles out from the largest village in the land of grass. For the past three days, after they traveled most of the day Arhat would teach Naruto a little bit of a taijutsu keita. Each one was a continuation of the whole keita, 
but Arhat said it would be easier to get the whole thing if learned a few moves at a time. He had also been bonding with the fox kit and found out it was in fact a boy. Naruto had decided to name the kit Orenji Shoku no Cage which literally meant orange shadow and called him Cage for short. Cage had grown in the past three days from small enough to fit in the palm of Naruto's hand to big enough to be a fully grown cat. Naruto was working through his kata at the moment as Arhat was cooking. Cage was watching intently as Naruto ran through the series of kicks, punches, and throws. Cage yipped at Naruto before walking beside him. What you want to give it a try? Naruto asked in confusion. Yip. Nod. Naruto nodded his head. Okay well then I'll restart and you follow. Unknown to the pair Arhat was watching this with keen interest. This seemed to be an interesting turn of events. Given that the Uzumaki had never been beast familiar ninja he had no idea how to go about training the boy in this. Perhaps he would just let them figure this one out on their own. It wouldn't be the first time this had happened. Naruto come over here please. Arhat said from his spot by the fire where he had been making a stew. Cage and Naruto walked over to the fire and sat waiting for the man to speak. Arhat began ladling out three bowls of stew into large loaves of bread that he had unsealed from a storage scroll. The three began to eat their supper before Arhat spoke. I will be teaching you the beginning of the tree walking chakra exercise. You will practice this while I go get Karen. How come I can't go with you? Naruto asked with a pout. Because there have been a string of kidnappings from this area. Arhat explained. I will be leavening you in a seal barrier. Naruto nodded. I guess that makes sense. He said after giving it some thought. Arhat smiled before walking towards a fairly large tree. Now what you need to know about this training is that it won't be easy. First of all you have to focus a set amount of chakra to your feet. If it's too much you will be blown off the tree like a rocket. Too little and you just won't stick. Arhat began to steadily walk up the side of the tree to a large limb where he proceeded to stand on the bottom side, completely defying the laws of gravity. Naruto gazed at his great uncle in awe. Truly. The younger Uzumaki thought. This was what it meant to be a ninja. The ability to defy the laws of physics simply at will. Now you try just focus the chakra into your feet. If it's easier, then lie on the ground and prop your feet against the tree until it sticks. Arhat said with a smirk. Naruto did as he was told and laid down on the ground. He pressed his feet to the tree and added chakra to them before he went quickly sliding across the ground. Much to the amusement of Cage and Arhat. Both of which burst out with laughter. Naruto rose off the ground and glared at Cage. You do it then if you're so smart. Naruto roared. Cage yipped happily before he ran at the tree then straight up it, dot for three steps. He then fell back to the ground, much to Naruto's amusement. Arhat though, was very much intrigued by this turn of events as he hadn't expected the small fox to be able to use chakra. He watched for 15 more minutes before he got up and said. Alright Naruto I'm going to get Karen. I'm going to set up a barrier that you'll be safe behind. Naruto just nodded but kept trying to walk up the tree. He continued on for what seemed like hours but in reality was only one and a half before he heard. Get her. Naruto stopped and watched as a girl ran by. She was wearing a tattered pair of grey shorts, a ragged red t-shirt. She also had a grey and red beanie on her head. She ran right by the seal's barrier without looking at Naruto but seemed to be terrified. Just as the girl passed from Naruto's vision three scruffy looking men came barreling through the brush. Oi tai I'm sure that brat came this way. One cried as they ran through. Naruto growled. He took off directly behind them. He could hear them up ahead as they caught up with the girl. We got you now you little bitch. One of the men cried angrily. There was a loud slap and Naruto burst into the clearing. The men spun around to see Naruto gazing at the emitting a dangerously cold killer intent. What's with the midget? One of the men asked glaring at Naruto. Another drew a tonto from his side. Doesn't matter. Sound wants brats so we nab em both. Naruto slammed his hands into a ram seal and flared his chakra. Without so much as a What's going on? The ground split open and a large group of vines shot out and wrapped around the men. They wear thick purple briar vines. Naruto glared at them before he flared his chakra again and watched as the vines began to tighten sharply. The vines squeezed the three men, until they were gasping for breath. Naruto quickly panicked and tried to release the technique, 
only for it to tighten even further before pulling back sharply and shredding the men's bodies. The briars on the vines worked like the teeth of a saw and eviscerated the three men. Naruto saw this happen and screamed in panic. He hadn't meant to kill the men and especially not in such a spectacularly bloody fashion. The girl, who up until this time had been clutching a small wooden flute to her chest, while trying to look as small as possible, realized that this boy had just saved her life. In a fit of pity she walked over and wrapped him in a tight embrace. She stroked his hair gently and whispered that it would be okay. Thankfully Arhat was already on the way back and had heard Naruto's pained scream. He picked up the small girl who was walking beside of him, and began running through the tree limbs at top speed. Much to her chagrin. He arrived at the scene to see Naruto being rocked by a young red-haired girl, while three bodies lay on the ground not ten feet away. He also noticed the large crack in the ground and the blood-covered briar vines. What happened here? He asked uncertain that he truly wanted the answer. Those three were chasing me when Blondie showed up and made the vines kill them. I don't think he meant to because he freaked out after they got shredded. The girl said nonchalantly. Arhat sighed before picking up the catatonic blonde and said. Come with me to our camp we'll sort this out there. He then turned around and walked through the woods without looking back. Arhat sighed as he crossed the seal's barrier. He was still carrying the catatonic Naruto in his arms and he was being followed by two red-haired girls and a little fox. He sat down Naruto and gazed into the emotionless eyes. He sighed again before drawing his hand back and slapping the young blonde. Naruto jerked back to reality as the girls gasped, and Cage growled at Arhat. Naruto listened to me carefully. Those men put you in a situation where if you hadn't have killed them they would have hurt you and the girl. Arhat said heavily wishing he wouldn't have had to have this conversation for a few more years. What you did is what all ninja must do to stay safe. The world of a ninja is kill or be killed. Now ask yourself is the life of three men worth your own when they are attacking you for no good reason? Naruto gazed at his great uncle while contemplating his words. They had been attacked the girl while she cried. Then they tried to attack him. So did they truly deserve Naruto's remorse? No they deserved to die right? So why did he feel life the lowest piece of trash to walk the earth? Why does it hurt so badly, if I did the right thing? Naruto whimpered, which caused the two girls to gaze sadly at the broken boy. Because it proves that although it's your job you're not a monster. R had explained knowingly. Even though it's our jobs, the price for taking another life is the guilt and the stigma that goes along with that death. The day it stops hurting is the day you're so covered in blood that you're no longer recognized as a human. So the pain is the price for the job? Naruto asked in frustration. Yes. Arhat said simply. If that pain is too great I suggest you try to find a different job. It was blunt and cruel, but this was the kick in the pants Naruto needed to pull himself together. Naruto nodded while quietly contemplating this. So Arhat turned around to the young girl with the flute. I would like the name of the girl my clan's heir just risked his life to rescue, he said gruffly. I'm Tayuya Uzumaki, the girl said without hesitation or fear, and I didn't ask Blondie to save me so shove the attitude up your ass. Arhat blinked at the little red-haired Spitfire owlishly, before bursting out laughing. Well I suppose that this is fortuitous then. It was Tayuya's turn to blink owlishly. For to I what? She asked when she regained her reasoning. It's a big word that means lucky, Arhat explained. Oh. What lucky exactly? She asked suspiciously gazing at Arhat. Karen was watching this all play out from the sidelines and decided to answer. We are all Uzumaki that's lucky. Hold up that can't be right. My mom always told me that you could always tell an Uzumaki because of their red hair. How could Blondie be the heir to a clan of red heads? Tayuya asked crossing her arms trying to look intimidating. His father was a blonde. Arhat answered as if that clarified everything, and perhaps it did. How did he do that thing with the vines? Tayuya asked still unsure about all of this. I don't know. Arhat admitted. Kayubi. Naruto mumbled from where he was sitting. Arhat paled before asking. What do you mean Naruto? Kayubi offered me a keke jenke if I released him when I discovered a way to do it. Naruto admitted without looking up at any of the three people. I asked for Mokaton he said he would give me the closest thing he was capable of. You can't release him without killing yourself, Arhat said stoically. Well I figured since he was put there with a seal he could be released by one as well. 
Naruto said thoughtfully. But I didn't know how to go about this I figured maybe after I trained I would figure it out. Arhat put on a thoughtful look and began to really think about this from a Fuenjutsu standpoint. He had to admit the idea had merit. Of course it would take time and he knew that it would take at least three different seals to be done safely but it was possible. You'll have to really buckle down and learn all there is to know about Fuenjutsu but I believe you can do it, he said at last. The girls, who had been stunned silent upon the realization that Naruto was not only a Jinchuritsuki but the Jinchuritsuki of the Kyubi decided that this was a good time to voice their displeasure. Do you want to let a biju out of its cage? Are you crazy? They asked simultaneously. He gave me in cage a gift. Naruto said easily. He explained to who my parents were and he explained why he attacked the leaf village. And that makes freeing him okay? Tiyuya asked incredulously. Would you like to be cage for the last 80 years? Naruto asked glaring at her. Cause he was. She recoiled like she had been smacked. The thought honestly hadn't occurred to her. What must it be like to be locked up for so long just for being what you were? I'm sorry Blondie, I didn't think about it like that. She stated softly. Karen was nodding as she to realize that this was not how she originally saw it. Arhat chuckled. Naruto woke up to see Arhat packing everything in camp up. He watched in fascination as the elder man put things on a scroll only for them to disappear. Naruto couldn't help but smile to himself. He had a great sensei even if he didn't choose him. Arhat saw Naruto watching him and said. Naruto could you wake up the girls please we have a lot of ground to cover today. Naruto nodded and walked over to Karen and to Yuya. He gently shook Karen who mumbled five more minutes. He frowned before turning to Tuyuya. He had no sooner touched her shoulder than she sat up. Naruto backed up in surprise. What do you want, Blondie I was trying to sleep, she stated with a grimace. Arhat Gigi said that I should wake you up we've got a lot of ground to cover. Naruto replied somewhat meekly. Tuyuya frowned at him. Well I guess you did your job then. Naruto frowned at this. Karen won't wake up. He muttered. Oh that's easy to fix. Tuyuya said sticking her pointer finger into her mouth before giving the other girl a wet willy. Karen shot off the ground and smacked Tuyuya. Ow. Tuyuya said sullenly rubbing her sore jaw. Karen was glaring daggers at the older girl, but Naruto was rolling on the ground laughing his butt off. Arhat shook his head at the antics of the three Uzumaki children thinking how very upbeat these next few years would be for him. Naruto went to sit beside the still sleeping form of Cage. He stroked the fox's fur gently and was rewarded with the soft purring sound. He lost all semblance of time until Arhat handed him a bowl of the night before stew and said, Eat it. You're going to need the nutrients. Naruto nodded his accent before digging into the bowl. He watched as Arhat finished packing up the camp before he reached up and plucked a few leaves off of a low-hanging tree. He handed one to each of the children. Now it's well known that all Uzumaki have huge chakra reserves compared to normal people. So I want you all to balance these leave on your fingertips while you walk. This will help you control your chakra unconsciously. He said showing them how the exercise was supposed to work. He watched as they all tried it and was unsurprised that Naruto had the most trouble. Soon though, they all had the exercise down enough to walk, while doing it. Arhat smiled as he saw this. It made him happy to be teaching again, he'd missed it more than he thought. Hirazan Serutobi gazed at the pile of paperwork in front of him. It was truly heartbreaking. At least, he thought so. He had given many years of his life to this village, but they still called for more. Sometimes his more morbid thoughts said that the only way he would be free of this job would be if he were to die in service of the village. Thankfully these morbid thoughts were few and far between. He looked down at the paper in his hand, before sighing in disgust. He hated this job. He thought back to the events of his last council meeting. Flashback Hirazan frowned at the fools in front of him. Naruto and Arhat hadn't even been gone for 12 hours before this emergency meeting had been called. Danzo stood up and said, Hokage-sama it has been brought to our attention that Uzumaki Naruto has not been seen in the village for some time. I feel it would be wise to go and retrieve the errant child. Has that in fact been brought to your attention Danzo? Hirazan said with a scowl. How much time has the boy been missing from the public's view? Because I just saw him no less than eight hours ago. I don't know what you mean Hirazan. I do believe I heard a rumor that he had been potted being carried away by an older man, 
leaving from the north gate late last night. Danzo said with a concerned look on his face. We should be searching for him as he is a village asset. You are dangerously close to committing treason, Hirazin stated coldly. I have only this village's best interest at heart Sandame Sama. Danzo said looking like he'd swallowed a lemon. Hirazin sighed aloud, knowing that his next move was going to cause him a multiple day long migraine. Well as this supposed concerned citizen stated, yes Suzumaki Naruto did leave the village. The room went deathly quiet, before the civilians began to cheer uproariously. The ninja all remained quiet, but they all had their own thoughts. They truly didn't care one way or the other in most cases. The noticeable differences were Uchiha Fugaku clan head of the Uchiha clan, and Aburume Shibi head of the Aburume clan, who held two totally different stances. While Shibi was upset that the boy was treated so badly, Fugaku was angry that the weapon he had plans for was now out of his reach. Who was the man that carried the boy off Sandame Sama? Asked the Jonin commander Shikaku Nara, head of the Nara clan. His great grand uncle, Arhat Uzumaki, Hirazan said with a slight smirk. He watched with no small amount of satisfaction at the paling of the ninja side of the council, which included all three elders. The three elders were calling for his immediate retrieval, while the rest of the ninja wondered just what that would cause. The civilians, having no idea about the danger that Arhat represented for the elders' plans or indeed the very village if not tread carefully were uncaring. Hokage sama interjected Shibi. Will the boy be returned after training with his uncle? That was the plan along with the return of the Uzumaki clan to Konoha as a permanent clan here. Hirazan admitted with a solemn nod. Now that this has been discussed and I have given you all the information on the subject that you will receive I declare this matter closed. Flashback and the civilians had thrown a party to celebrate the demon's removal from the village. Hirazan had been tempted to send his Anbu out on a kill of sight mission till they all shut up. But alas his better judgment won out and he had left a few hours early to spend time with his grandson Konohamaru. The foursome traveled east for a week and a half on foot, before they came to the ocean. From there they took a boat to the island of Uzu. They all gazed appreciatively at the island they had come to. Welcome to your ancestral home. This place was once known as Uzu Shiogakure or Uzu. Arhat said while gazing at the crumbling walls ahead of them. What happened to it? Tayuya asked bluntly. We were attacked by the combined might of Kumo, Suna, and Iwa. We managed to drive them out but the cost was too great. Now you gaze upon our legacy. Arhat said heavily. If it's destroyed why are we here Gigi? Naruto asked scrunching his face in confusion. While the village was indeed destroyed, the Uzumaki compound was not. It is currently the safest place in the world for anyone of Uzumaki descent. Arhat said leading the group forward. They quietly walked through the corpse of the former village. Everywhere they looked they could see the damages of a long forgotten war. There were bones scattered about, rusted weapons lay long since forgotten, building destroyed by high-ranking elemental just you. Remember my young charges. No matter what the reason, this is why war is never the correct answer. Arhat said sagely which received a round of nods. They continued to walk through the graveyard feeling more and more somber as they did so. Soon though, they saw a large compound in the distance. It was completely untouched by the death all around. Its walls stood proudly against the death and decay all around it. They could see a large house that seemed big enough to fit a small army inside. Even with the wall and the rest of the battlefield between them and the house they could all feel the call of home coming from the compound. It took another half hour from the time they first laid eyes on the compound till they arrived. Arhat casually pulled out a kanai and slit his palm, before walking forward and rubbing the blood into a sealing array on the gate. That was a blood seal. He stated as the seal lit up and the gate opened. Only someone with Uzumaki blood can open the gates. What would happen if someone else tried? Karen asked gazing at the grounds in wonder. Well depending on how the seal was set up anything from them being locked in stasis, to them being incinerated. Arhat said thoughtfully. The three kids paled drastically, before walking into the compound. There was a large training ground, an orchard of fruit trees, a large pond with floating gazebo, and a very large cave mouth. Well this is where you will be receiving your training for the next few years. Arhat said before closing the gates. I suggest you go find a room and get some shut eye. Tomorrow is the beginning of hell for all of you. The first week was just as Arhat described. 
Hell. They were woken up at 5 o'clock in the morning and given a light breakfast. Then they had a five mile run. Then they were to practice taijutsu. They practice physical training from 5 to 12.30. Then it was lunch. After lunch Arhat began drilling them on chakra control. They were forced to do the tree walking exercise for as long as they could before having to rest. After said rest they would do games like shogi go and Chinese checkers. Then it was dinner and bed. This continued for the first month before the entire schedule was switched around. Their meal times and wake up times stayed the same but they were given maps with toy soldiers and a list of different skills they had and made to send the soldiers on different missions. If the soldiers died they were replaced, it was kind of like a game but with gritty ninja realism. After the make-believe mission, they had chakra control exercises. Then lunch before they had to run their 5 miles, with an added 10 pounds on each limb. After their run they started on weapons training. Each chose a weapon to specialize with and were given one-on-one -on -one training with an Arhat clone. This randomization continued for rest of their training with the miles they had to run being up every three months. The weights on their limbs escalated five pound each month. The graduated from wooden weapons to the real thing. Fuinjutsu was added to their curriculum. Also they began on their elemental ninjutsu training. Naruto stood before his sensei waiting expectantly. Cage sat on his haunches beside him. Arhat gazed at the pair before him angrily before saying. Why did you feel the need to destroy the training area? Naruto looked over the area at the devastation of Cage's jutsu. The area looked like a bomb had gone off in the middle of the training ground. And given that Cage had used a tailed beast ball, it kind of did. Well Kyubi told me he has been funneling some of his chakra into Cage as we sleep for the past two years. He suggested that since Cage had chakra reserves at about a sixteenth of the one tail, that maybe he would be able to do a smaller version of the Bijudama. Naruto explained. So Kayubi explained the process to me and I passed it on to Cage so he could try. Arhat held up his hands in a stalling motion, then said. Wait you mean to tell me that Cage did this? Yep. Naruto said, while Cage nodded. Arhat gazed at the dog-sized fox for a moment. It now stood at a good foot and a half at the shoulder. He was three feet long from nose to tail and he was panting as though he had spent the day running. Arhat bit the inside of his cheek. Naruto. He began. I don't think that it will be good for Cage to be subjected to only Biju Chakra. Okay so what asked Kayubi to stop? Naruto asked while cocking his head to the side. No, but I do think a not quite so toxic chakra should also be added to the mix. So I think that if you and Cage will allow me to I'm going to add a nature chakra filter seal so that whenever Kayubi injects Cage with his chakra, the same amount of nature chakra also gets introduced to his chakra system. Naruto looked down at Cage. What do you think Cage it's your chakra? Cage cocked his head and gazed at Arhat for a few moments, but eventually he nodded. Arhat nodded before pulling out his fuinjutsu set. This will take a while he said as he began drawing a ceiling array around the fox. The ceiling had taken five hours. Arhat said that the reason it had taken so long was because the very nature of natural chakra was very temperamental. Naruto had been very interested, and asked many questions. Arhat chuckled and said that the inclusion of nature chakra was level 10, the very highest rank of fuinjutsu. A rank that not even his father had achieved before his untimely demise. Naruto buckled down and began to focus on his sealing techniques a whole lot harder after learning about nature chakra. Now that Arhat was sure that all three children had a good amount of chakra, low to high janin, he taught them the shadow clone jutsu, which the Uzumaki designed and offered to Konoha as a gift of friendship between the villages, along with a few other jutsu. He explained how they were going to use the jutsu to train, needless to say they were all thrilled at the idea of using clones to speed up their training. They seemed to be rushing through their training at the devil's own pace. Naruto was well on his way to mastering his first element to his bloodline, which he chose Earth. He also was on level 6 of the Fuinjutsu, and was almost a master of Dojutsu. He had found a staff that had been a gift from Hashirama Senju, made of his Mokaton. It was able to extend and shrink when Naruto focused his bloodline into it. Karen was working on her first element as well hers being fire. She was only on level 2 of Fuinjutsu, not truly being interested, but was picking it up when she practiced, she also was doing very well with medical jutsu and had discovered that her chakra had healing properties. 
she had been learning kenjutsu for if anybody got close but hadn't found the right sword in the armory. Tiyuya was almost done with her first element having started earlier than the other two, given that she was a year older. Her element was actually water. She stopped learning fuenjutsu after the first level, as she didn't really want to learn it. She was well on her way to being a genjutsu mistress though. She also learned kenjutsu to use her flute if anyone got to close. Arhat smiled it had only been three years that he had been training them, but they were all powerhouse genin, and they would only get better. The remaining three years were spent training with shadow clones. Tayuya was able to use five at a time, while still being able to train. Karen, who had much finer chakra control, was able to use seven. And Naruto was unsurprised able to use thirty at a time, mostly because Arhat flat out refused to allow him to use more until later in his training. Each had progressed spectacularly. Tayuya had mastered every genjutsu in the library, and begun to create her own using the sounds of her flute. She also progressed to near mastery levels of kenjutsu, and could use her flute against any weapon without fear of it being ruined. Unless she was facing a true master. She liked to incorporate double and triple layer genjutsu. Her favorite thing to do though was to use her, Uzumaki Hijutsu, elemental songs. They were genjutsu that were so real it seemed the elements seemed to obey the will of Tiyuya's flute. Karen had been steadily increasing her medical knowledge, to the point that she was easily a fully realized medical ninja. While she was no Tsunade she was only 12. She had come up with quite a few ideas, regarding ways to heal ninja in the field. She was also very accomplished in the field of Kenjutsu. Her style was all about redirection and return attacks. She was also on level 5 of Fuenjutsu which dealt with stasis seals and sealing living beings into storage seals. Naruto and Cage had grown the most. They had practice and used trial and error to create their own style of taijutsu, which they called the Kitsune's Fist. It was all about trickery and the use of unusual movements to provide power. Naruto had also gotten very good at dojutsu, which he could now use in tandem with a set of sealed playing cards. There were multiple different seals placed on the cards, from smoke bombs and flashbangs to full-on double the power explosives. He had barrier seals and chakra repression seals. He was working on his bloodline as well and had quite a few jutsu, which included plant release, Kami's bounty, plant release, Akuma's garden, and plant release, poison briar bindings. But his true greatness was his fuenjutsu. He had finally progressed to level 10 a little less than six months ago and had begun designing his own Uzumaki Stone Guardian. The Uzumaki Stone Guardians were a group of fuenjutsu made warriors. They ran off of nature chakra, which also brought them to a semblance of life. Each guardian was created by an Uzumaki who had completed level 10 sealing. There were currently only four of them. One could use a low level jutsu from each element. Another was adept at most forms of kenjutsu, not to mention 10 feet tall. Yet another was able to use a specially designed taijutsu that implemented nature chakra to redirect large scale jutsu. And finally Arhat's own was designed with the idea that if you don't see the enemy it will be able to kill you. With a special seal he created, and the use of nature chakra. This guardian, by far the smallest, was able to kill any target without ever being seen. Now it was Naruto's turn to create a guardian. Naruto had decided it would be a good idea to make a flying guardian, so that he always had the upper hand. But he realized it would be incredibly hard to make a stone guardian that could fly. So instead of creating a stone guarding he decided to create a stone eagle. Its body was made of obsidian so as to be much lighter, but the seals he was to place on it would make it harder than diamond. It had the normal nature chakra injection seal, but he added a wind nature transference seal as well which would turn some of the nature chakra into wind chakra allowing for the flight. He added a sight transference seal so that he could see what the eagle saw if he so chose, which had interesting applications for taijutsu. He also had a low-level wind jutsu seal which allowed the eagle to use wind-style great breakthrough by flapping its wings hard enough. Naruto was happy with his performance up till now. He thought he was more than ready to go back to Konoha and become a ninja. He had quite a few plans he wanted to implement. He wanted to repay the Aburume clan for their kindness so he thought that he would find a large bug egg and seal it with nature chakra and the chakra of one of the Aburume so that they would become partners like him in Cage. He also wanted to finish off what was surely a familial obligation, that he felt needed to be taken care of. I will be going after Aoi Rokusho. 
Naruto told Arhat, to Yuya, and Karen. Why do you keep bringing that up Blondie? To Yuya asked with exasperation clear in her voice. Because I'm the clan heir so I have to retrieve it and return it to the Senju. Naruto said with a sigh. It was clear this was a well picked at discussion. Before you two go into this all over again I believe that if you feel you are ready then this is something that will be your final test. Arhat said thoughtfully. He had a map in his hand, and a backpack beside him. Naruto wondered not for the first time how he always seemed to know what was going to happen. Naruto nodded, before pulling out a few items. One was given to Karen, who looked at it in confusion. It seemed to be a cylindrical hilt with no blade, it had sealing arrays all over it and seemed heavier than it should be. This is a weapon I created for you. It is designed by using seals alongside a piece of the large meditation crystals in the cave to create a blade of pure chakra. You can use your regular chakra as a weapon, or your medical chakra as a healing tool. She gazed at him in absolute awe. He smiled at her before moving on. He handed to Yuya a flute. It too was covered in sealing arrays. It is made to be strong enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any weapon but a legendary one. It won't break or mess with the sound either. Also it will play better than even the highest quality flute money can buy. The music will carry much further than normal and it will be much more subtle. Then he moved on to Arhat. I haven't figured out what to give you, so I made you this. He handed Arhat a sealed cannabo. It was larger than his old one, but surprisingly it wasn't heavier. It was also thicker and made better. Arhat nodded at Naruto, before saying. Be careful he is a Jonin for a reason. Don't take unnecessary risks and make sure you take the head. Naruto nodded. He then took the map and the backpack, and began to walk down the road. Cage followed beside him as they trailed away from the speechless girls and the beaming sensei. Naruto had been making his way west-northwest for the past five days. He was currently running the border between fire country and grass country. He had another good half a day's travel to reach the rain country border. Loping along beside him at a sedate pace was Cage, and flying circles overhead, keeping an eye out for trouble was his stone guardian. How are we going to do this exactly? Cage asked a bit lazily. Well since he stole the region, he has defected to a no-entry country so it'll have to be silently, Naruto said as he continued to run through the trees. The fox took this with a grain of salt, so that means no bijudamas in the town square right? Yes that's what it means, Naruto said exasperatedly. How are you going to get him? Cage asked seriously. I don't know right off the top of my head, he admitted sullenly. Probably just kill his in his sleep. You really think that a Jonin is going to sleep through you getting that close? Cage asked skeptically. No but if I break into his house, plant the seals to keep him from noticing me and then get him when his guard is down. Yay I think it'll work. Naruto said nodding his head. Cage looked at his friend, brother, master skeptically. Well there is one thing for sure you definitely have the stealth skills. Let's just hope this all works out. Naruto and Cage walked sedately through the village gates of the capital of Rain Country. The people seemed to be terrified of their own shadows. Civilian in a ninja city usually were when it really sunk in just where they lived and what that entailed but they were more than just worried. Naruto wandered around listening to the gossip from a safe unrecognizable distance until he heard about a bar that ninjas hang out at after missions. Naruto made his way to the bar and got a table. He waited a little while trying to look lost. He was rewarded when a woman who looked old enough to be his mother walked over to him and said. Hey there sweetie, can I sit with you? Okay, he said innocently. She pulled out a chair and sat down. She had on a typical chunin outfit. Her brown hair framed her face pretty well. She was not overly feminine but not at all masculine. Naruto had to admit if she wasn't perving on someone more than half her age, namely himself, she would be fairly attractive. She put a sake bottle on the table and said, would you like to have a little fun? What do you mean? He asked with a voice loaded down with expertly faked confusion. Well I want to teach you a ninja game if you want to play. She said silkily, thinking she was going to score that night. Naruto had to hide his scowl. She thought him an innocent child and wanted to use him sexually. It made him almost physically sick. It would have been different had she known he was a ninja and a consenting adult, but she wanted to rape a child. It appalled him. Naruto murmured that he would like that, and was soon being led out of the bar. The woman picked him up in her arms and jumped to the roofs. 
Cage followed along behind her stealthily through the shadows. After a few minutes of jumping from roof to roof she landed outside of an apartment. She quickly opened the door and carried Naruto into the bedroom. I'm going to go to the bathroom really quick okay sweetie. She asked before turning and exiting the room without even waiting for a response. Again Naruto was angered, but this time he had a plan. He took a few seeds from a pocket of his skin-tight girl's jeans, he slid one up each sleeve of his black hoodie. He lay on the bed and waited. It didn't take long, she came out completely naked wearing a 8-inch strap on dildo. Now we need to get you undressed my little cutie. She said swaying her hips making the dildo bob up and down. She was so focused on her prey she didn't realize he was discreetly making hand seals until two briar-covered vines erupted from his sleeves and wrapped around her. The briars dug into her skin and made her scream out in pain. Now you are going to answer my questions or I will kill you very slowly. He told her, making the vines tighten to emphasize the point. She nodded frantically that she understood. Good. He said before standing up and walking towards her. Where does Aoiro Kusho live and is he in the village right now? He lives three blocks away and know he's supposed to be gone for a mission this week, she stammered quickly. I need his exact place of residence. Naruto stated emotionless. She gave it. Naruto turned and began to exit her room only to hear. Aren't you going to let me go? No I'm not you pedophiliac freak. He said not looking back. With a squeeze of his hand the vines tightened, and then he unclenched his fist and whispered. Briar vine bindings. Evisceration. Naruto left the Chunin's apartment and made his way to where she said Aoi's apartment was. He walked up to it and placed his ear to the door. There was no sound inside, so he opened it. He stepped inside and placed a life detection seal on the floor and activated it. It revealed that no one had been in the apartment in days. He simply smiled and begun placing the tags for a five-point barrier seal, a chakra depletion and suppression seal and a minor genjutsu seal that would hide the others. After he was done, he left the apartment, and went to a cheap hotel. He paid for a week in advance got the key and headed out for the town. He looked through the clothing stores, finding some nice female boot-cut jeans, lots of the wide-wristed long-sleeve shirts that he liked and even some makeup to go with it all. He was about to call it quits and head for his motel room, when he noticed a small girl watching him in cage. She was wearing a five sizes to big t-shirt and was covered in grime. He would guess that she was about four years old and he could see the signs of malnutrition. He slowly walked over to her and offered her an apple from his backpack. She took it looking at him in reverence before he smiled sadly and turned to walk away. She followed his in what a child would consider a stealthy manner. He turned to face her. She looked up at him innocently. Cage looked at her for a moment and then looked to Naruto. Perhaps she thinks you are her mother? Naruto scowled. This had not been the first time Cage had commented on his choice to wear feminine clothing. We can't take her with us, he said at last biting his lip, while trying to fight off her puppy dog eyes. I see no reason not to. We have a room which will offer protection from the elements for at least as long as we have to wait for the thief to return, Cage said without much thought. And when he comes back and we eventually leave, Naruto asked all but pleading for a way out of this. We take her with us of course. Cage said nonchalantly, can you really leave her here on the streets of a ninja village? Before Naruto could say anything she held up her hands for Naruto to pick her up and said, please. Naruto looked deep into her light pink eyes. Oh for the love of Kami, he said picking up the girl and leaving. They made their way to the motel room, passing but the uncaring valet and disappeared into the room. After they were there, Naruto took the girl into the bathroom. He removed the shirt and placed the child in the tub. He filled the tub with water and grabbed a bar of soap. After the girl had been thoroughly scrubbed he gave her one of his tighter shirts that flared at the bottom so it looked kind of like a dress. He laid her in the bed and watched as she went right off to sleep. He gazed down at her. She had auburn hair and a pair of tiny cupid's bow lips. Her cheeks were flushed, and her soft pink skin seemed to glow. He hung his head slowly. Just how was he supposed to explain this to Arhat? He went on an assassination mission and comes back with a kid? Cage sat on the foot of his master's bed watching the parade of emotions flashing through Naruto's face. You could no more leave that child than you could cut out your own heart. It tears you up enough to kill someone you know without question as a scumbag. Cage said after what he felt was an appropriate amount of brooding on Naruto's part. 
What you need to think about though is that you only have a limited amount of money available for this mission, and that child needs clothes and shoes. Not to mention she will be another stomach to feed. Naruto laughed at that. You're right Cage it's just that after I get back from this mission, we'll all be headed to Konoha. I have just damned that kid to those stupid civilian idiocy. Better their stupidity than slowly starving here. Remember there are worse fates for a street urchin than being thought bad by a few cough thousand cough idiots. Cage said grinning, which showed off his ivory white canines. Naruto grinned in return. You're right of course. He admitted softly before sighing. Please watch over her. I'll put up a locking seal as I go out so you'll have to take the tag down to let me in. Cage nodded as Naruto headed for the door. Going to get some money? Naruto grinned a foxy grin he had learned from Cage. Of course I am. Then I'll stop by some clothing stores and get her some clothes. Naruto hanged into a 19-year-old girl and walked into a gambling house. He walked right up to the chips exchange guy behind the desk. I need chips please. He said putting all the money he had with him on the desk. The man nodded and gave him a stack of chips. Naruto then went to play poker. He sat down at the first free chair he came to. He soon cleared out the table and went to another, higher stakes game. He continued this till he made it to the high roller game which had a pot of 2 million ryo. By this time it was obvious to anybody paying attention that Naruto had the devil's own luck when it came to cards. Of course the person Naruto was playing against obviously knew how to play the game to the fullest though. So he was playing against skill using only luck. Strangely enough it was even at the moment. Finally Naruto grinned. I would like to make it all or nothing if that's all right with you. He said pushing all of his chips forward to the center of the pot. The crowd's eyes widened. But his opponent just grinned, before pushing his own into the pot. Would it be too much trouble to call for a new deck and dealer? Naruto asked sweetly. The brown-haired crimson-eyed man smiled, before saying. What's a matter Shuri you surely don't think ol' Remy would cheat Cha de ya? Naruto grinned mischievously. Not at all handsome but I don't want it being said that I cheated either. That seems fair Shuri so by all means, bring us out a new dealer. The guy said jovially. Naruto watched as a new dealer came to the table bearing an unopened deck of cards. The pair watched in silence as they were dealt the respective hands. Remy get two cards, Naruto got four. By the time they had their cards, both had a self-satisfied smile on their faces. Remy looked at the busty blonde girl in front of him. Hey Shuri. Let's make this more interesting no? Remy said with a smirk. What do you have in mind sugar? Naruto asked even though he had an idea. Well Shuri it seems like Lady Luck likes this here game, so how about a kiss for the winner? He asked wiggling his eyebrows suggestively. Why Mr. Lebeau that is awfully forward of you but by all means one chaste kiss to the winner? Naruto said returning the smirk. With a grin Remy said. Well I might as well claim my winnings. Then he proceeded to flip over his cards to reveal a royal flush in hearts. Well I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I have to take the money and the kiss. With that said Naruto proceeded to reveal, the Ten of Spade, the Jack of Spades, the Queen of Spades, the King of Spades, and finally the Ace of Spades. That's the high suit I believe. Remy was gobsmacked. Here this tiny slip of a girl was just took all the money he had. The he grinned widely. At least he'd still get the kiss. So he proceeded to walk around the table, pull Naruto into a tight embrace and kiss him speechless. You win Shuri, he said before leaving the casino. Naruto stayed still as a statue, but softly brushed his fingers to his lips. I didn't think he was serious, he finally said before collecting the winnings. After he had collected the money from the exchange man, he made his way to an always open clothing store that catered to ninja and civilians. He walked up to the cashier and said I need eight sets of clothing that will fit this girl. Then he calmly hanged into the girl. The cashier looked at him then nodded and said this way. He was led to a rack of girls clothing. He picked out four dresses at random, and then proceeded to gather four skirts and eight shirts. He paid for the clothes and sealed them in a storage scroll. After all of this was done, he casually walked back to the motel room and knocked on the door. He waited till Cage said, you can come in now. Naruto walked through the door and lay down on the bed beside the child. Did you get the money? Cage asked inquisitively. Naruto woke up to find an unfamiliar weight on his chest. Now being a ninja grants you a few things if you live long enough. 
One of those is an intense sense of paranoia, another is a sharp analytical mind. These two were running through Naruto's mind like squirrel on meth. First he was freaking out trying to figure out where he was and if someone was trying to kill him. Yes his training had in fact been that intense but he was a better ninja for it. The logic-based part of his brain was giving him the cold hard facts. He noted the cheap motel room. He could feel Cage curled up on his left side. There was a soft breathing sound filling his ears. And finally, there was a curtain of auburn ringlets on his chest. He quickly came to realize that all was well. He remembered the tiny girl he had fallen asleep beside, and realized she must have decided to use his chest as a pillow. After he stilled his hammering heartbeat down, he looked around the room. He quickly used the Kirawarmi technique to replace himself with a pillow before he went into the bathroom to answer nature's call. After he was done he left the room and made his way to the restaurant district. He walked into a small building that seemed to have plenty of customers. He ordered a large order of mint-flavored dumpling, orange duck bites and some lo mein noodles to go. After his order was taken and had begun to be cooked, he sat down on a bench and began working through his thoughts. He was sure that it would be soon that the life-detecting seal that he had activated in Aoi's apartment would go off soon. His thoughts then turned to the small child he had found. He was still unsure how that had all come to play, but had no idea how it could have gone differently. From the moment her large pink eyes landed on his own cerulean blue ones she could have asked for the world and he would probably given it to her. Cursing his overly caring tendencies, he forced his mind away from any thoughts of the red-haired cherub. Unfortunately they then turned to how he was going to get said child from the city. He didn't know what Ames' policy was in regards to orphan children, but he was pretty sure they wouldn't let someone here to assassinate one of their ninja adopt one of said orphans. His thoughts were interrupted when the Kaye handed him his food before bowing politely. Naruto quickly paid the man and gave him twice the amount of money as a tip for his politeness. The man's eyes bugged out and he began to protest, only to look up and find Naruto gone. Naruto smiled happily as he entered the motel room, only to be accosted by auburn-haired missile. He was about to push the child off when he realized that she was crying into his shirt while clinging to his chest. She seemed to think you had abandoned her. Cage commented softly from the bed. Naruto sat the food down and looked at the girl. He went down on his knees and looked her right in the eyes. Hey sweetie I am not now nor at no time in the future going to abandon you. I just left for a little while. I promise you I will always come back, okay? She nodded her eyes watery from the tears she had obviously been crying. He thought to himself about what could have happened to this child to make her fear being abandoned. He gazed into her watery pink eyes and cringed at the loneliness he saw there. I have you and I promise no matter what I'm going to take care of you, he said softly. MMK. She mumbled into his neck as she clung to him for dear life. He smiled and gently put her on the bed. He picked up the bag of food and pulled out the orange duck bites. He handed the little tin bowl to the girl and encouraged her to eat. Cage watched as the orange duck was devoured with a supremely content expression, an obvious relish. Naruto laughed at her content expression. He was glad that she liked the pulled out one of the orders of noodles and set the bowl in front of Cage, who dung in. Then he pulled out the other cup of noodles and dug in himself. The three ate in silence each enjoying their meal. Once it was down they shared the mint-flavored dumplings before deciding to wander through the town. Naruto unsealed the clothes from their storage scroll, and let the girl inspect them. She gazed at them in wonder. She quickly pulled off Naruto's shirt and put on a pink sundress that matched her eyes. Once the girl was dressed they left the room to explore the town. They found a park, in which Naruto played with the girl and pushed her in the swing. Naruto would never openly admit it of course but he actually felt happy while he was playing with this child. They played at the park for another hour before going to get some food. Lunch was a sushi place. Naruto got a shark and eel roll for himself, a spicy tuna roll for Cage, and a regular sashimi roll for the kid. After they got done Naruto decided he needed a place to train. He sat down to meditate, and access the connection between him and the stone eagle. It was fairly easy to start seeing out of the eagle's eyes. Naruto began to gaze wonderingly around looking for a secluded training ground. It didn't take long to fulfill his needs either. He let the eagle's body return to flying around looking for Aoi. And he picked up the girl and carried her towards the training ground, followed quickly by Cage. 
Once they arrived at the training ground Naruto sat the girl down and walked to the center of the enclosed field. Naruto put his hands into his pockets and pulled out a few seeds. He tossed them onto the ground and went through a few hand seals. Plant release. Kami's garden, he called pouring chakra into the technique. It didn't take long before the clearing was filled with the most exotic flowers that could be found in the elemental nations. Naruto smiled at the display of color he had provided the area with. He was so focused on the flowers he didn't notice the girl trying to mimic his moves. She focused hard on doing what he did while making the ram seal. Her chakra poured out of her in molten waves. The ground around her began to heat up and soon turned to magma. Cage acted fast and grabbed the exhausted girl and jumped to safety. Well. He started looking between the pool of lava and the little girl. I think it's safe to say she be a ninja when she grows up. Naruto just nodded dumbly, looking at the tiny red-haired angel who was out cold from using too much chakra. He quickly picked her up and made his way back to the motel room. He wouldn't leave again for quite a few hours. It had been a week since the training incident. Naruto had rushed to the motel room and hadn't left since. The first thing that was bad was that his garden with a coinciding pool of lava was found by AIM ninja who were now were then looking for bloodline users. Then the chunin Naruto killed had been found, along with the bloody vines. After that the whole village had gone on high alert. And finally Naruto had to worry about what would happen when the village notices that one of its street urchins had been spotted with a stranger. By the time the week had passed and Aoi had finally showed up Naruto had been so terrified that he was attacking random shadows with deathblow punches if he heard a sound out of the way. He had finally gotten the little girl to say more than just please. She had decided to call him Big Sissy in regards to the fact that he seemed to enjoy cross-dressing. He honestly didn't mind much but he could get a name out of her. Finally he had cracked and asked if it was okay for him to name her. She said that since she didn't really have a name that she would like that. He had almost broke down to tears when she said that. Even with all he had been through in Konoha before Arhat found him he at least knew his own name. He had named her Pele Uzumaki. When asked why he explained that Pele was an island goddess of volcanoes. So since she had lava release it mad since. He had begun training her with how to call her chakra at will. He found that while her reserves weren't as high as a graduated genin they were well above a third year student which meant that she could be trained in chakra control. Naruto taught her the leaf sticking exercise, which she was currently doing. He had tried to teach her the basis his own fighting style in the confines of the motel room but there was only so much taijutsu that could be taught to a novice. Especially in the confines of a cheap motel room. He taught her how to cook though. He would grow fresh vegetables and fruits for her to practice with. He was about to put her to bed for the night when he felt the detection seal go off in Aoi's apartment. Naruto quickly made a few clones to get everything in his room sealed up in storage scrolls. He left Pele in the care of the clones and cage and made his way to Aoi's apartments. At the apartment he stood at the door and gazed inside the room. He was hesitant. Even though he would be fighting in the most advantage possible he was still going to be fighting a Janin. He drew in a deep breath and opens the door. He quickly ducked inside using his foot to shut the door while rolling away. It was a good thing he did to because there was a trail of senbon needles buried in the walls, that followed his progress to the kitchen. Naruto's face was grim as he stood behind the kitchen counter. He freaked out when he felt as much as heard the hum of the region activating. I don't know who you are but the fact that you locked us in this barrier means it's your fault it's here to begin with. Aoi's angry voice said getting closer to Naruto's hiding spot. Naruto quickly put down a flashbang seal covered card. He then stealthily crawled around to the other side of the table. It didn't take long for Aoi to activate the seal. The resulting explosion left him seeing stars. Unable to see he used the replacement technique to change places with a chair on the other side of the room. Which saved him from being wrapped up in Naruto's briar vine bindings technique. Naruto whipped around and tossed to smoke bomb sealed cards at Aoi and dove in pulling his shrunken staff from its hidden location up his right sleeve. He extended it to the length of a wakazashi and charged into the smoke. He struck with surgical precision not expected of dojutsu practitioner with a sword. Unfortunately it was quickly proven, that even when disoriented Aoi was still the superior swordsman. Naruto quickly found himself on the defensive. He quickly extended his staff's length to five and a half feet and began attacking rapidly. He quickly turned the tables on Aoi, and begun to advance on air across the room. 
with the staff's superior reach he was landing hits on his opponent outside his own range. Naruto was lost to the fight. He began reacting on pure instinct. His mind was gone. He was totally lost in the heat of battle. He swung the staff over his head and brought it down with a sharp crack. Aoi rolled away only to be met with a low-level explosive card that blasted him across the room. He struck the wall and fell to the floor subdued by a concussion. He gazed up only to see Naruto right in front of him with cold dead unresponsive eyes. Naruto raised his arms and shouted. Plant release, poison briar bindings, thick briar-filled vines erupted out of Naruto's sleeves and wrapped around Aoi gripping him tightly. Aoi cried in pain and his shoulder-length green hair fell over his eyes. He was coughing up blood and he was covered in bruises. He laughed dejectedly. I never thought I would be killed in my own home. His dying breath was taken when the berserk blonde said five words that chilled him to the bone. Plant release. Briar vine evisceration. The vines tightened on Aoi's prone form before uncurling with the speed of a chainsaw's chain, ripping his body apart, sending his blood everywhere. Naruto gazed at the corpse for a while before he finally regained himself. He looked at the apartment in revulsion. This was the first time he had lost his control in an uncontrolled environment. Usually it was only in times of the utmost stress. Like dealing with the fear of being discovered in unfriendly territory, or like fighting a life and death battle against a janin. He hurriedly rushed to the bathroom and begun to empty his stomach into the toilet. His thoughts were lost in the blood. He had absolutely no idea on how he had been covered in the blood. He sat down by the toilet and begun to rock back and forth. It took Naruto three and a half hours of freaking out to come out of his emotional breakdown. Truthfully the only reason he came out of it at all was because one of his clones poofed wanting to know what had taken so long. With the influx of the clone's memories, he was able to pull himself together and go collect Aoi's head as well as the Raijin. Once they were sealed away he used clones to deactivate the seals inside the room before planting a heavy output explosive seal in the middle of the apartment. It was a timed delay so that it would take an hour to explode. He then went to where Pele and Cage were waiting. He picked up Pele and clung to her for dear life. She didn't understand what exactly was wrong but she could tell something bad had happened. She clung to him tightly and whispered. It'll be okay big sissy. He gave a choked half laugh, half sob. Cage watched him silently before saying. You need to go take a quick shower. We are going to need to leave this place as fast as possible brother. Naruto nodded numbly before he disappeared into the bathroom where he took his shower on autopilot. Cage gazed sadly at the door. He knew that something terrible had to have happened. Naruto loathed killing with a passion so if he had to take a guess he would say Naruto lost control of himself and when he woke up he had probably killed Aoi in a most brutal fashion. Pele looked at the fox uncertainly. Foxy why is big sissy sad? He had to do something that really hurt his feelings, Pele. Cage said downcast. Will he be okay? She asked looking at the door intently. He will need time. I would say with a little time he'll be fine. Cage said hopefully. Naruto meanwhile was deep in the recesses of his mind. Naruto was curled up in a ball looking at nothing, but listening to Kayubi justify his action. You were fighting an opponent that needed to die. You wouldn't have been able to do that acting on your thoughts you don't like to kill. Personally I don't understand your reluctance but I do know if you didn't kill him you would have died. Plus your family would still be under the stain on your honor of anyone but the Senju wielding that blade. Now you are needed out there. Your own kit needs you. So if you have to have another breakdown then you have to wait till she is safe with the rest of your family. Kayubi said harshly though with no real anger in his words. Naruto looked shakily at the large fox. He slowly nodded before he began to disappear. He woke up in the process of getting dressed. He hurried the process and exited the room. Cage's eyes lit up happily when he saw Naruto's eyes more focused and in charge. Good you're back let's go. Naruto nodded before picking up Pele and exiting the motel. They walked from the red light district and quickly made their way from the city. Surprisingly they made it out of the town with no hassle. Apparently Chunin gate guards were a lazy breed of ninja. They were 30 yards out of the village when the explosive note in Aoi's apartment went off. Naruto looked back to see that no one was looking his way, before he began sprinting down the road using more and more chakra to go speeding away from the area. He and Cage ran at a pace that seemingly ate up the miles. 
In a few hours they had crossed 70 miles. They decided it was safe so they camped for the night. It was the first time in years that Naruto had a nightmare. It was also the first time that Pele decided that Naruto would be a good pillow. It took them five days to reach the ruins of Uzu. As soon as he saw that Pele was in good hands he broke down and sobbed brokenly. The surprise that the other Uzumaki felt at seeing the tiny child Naruto had carried in was eclipsed by the absolute shock on their faces when he handed the child to Karen and promptly fell to his knees and begun to sob brokenly. Arhat gazed at the child who was squirming in Karen's arms, then to his great nephew. He sighed sadly. He tried to think about what could have possibly done this to his nephew. He looked down at Cage. What happened? He asked. His voice strained with anxiousness. Well we found the girl. Naruto being Naruto, decided to bring her with us. He went to train and we discovered that she has the lava release bloodline when she tried to copy Naruto's Kami's garden technique. She created a pool of magma instead of a field of flowers. Cage said which everyone's eyes widened and they gazed at Pele. Well as fascinating as this is maybe we should take Naruto either inside the house or over to the crystal caves. Tiyuya said concern playing in her voice. Arhat looked at his nephew sheepishly. He was sad to admit he was more worried about what exactly had taken place than his nephew's current state. He quickly rectified that by scooping up the boy and walking towards the crystal caves. The other two followed. Once all of the Uzumaki, as well as the little adoptee and the fox familiar were in the cave they sat down around Naruto in the lotus position. They began pouring out their chakra into the crystals which began to radiate with a calming power. It didn't take too long before Naruto started to feel better. He finally calmed down enough to talk before telling them everything that had happened in AIM. He explained how he had freaked out when he finally confronted Aoi and eventually lost himself to his battle instincts, which everyone present was very well aware of just how lethal that was. Tiyuya shuddered. She had been the first one to find out just what happened when Naruto's body went on autopilot. If not for Arhat refereeing that match she would have died. I woke up standing over the same thing as I did when I saved Tiyuya. His blood was all over me, and viscera was all over the walls. And those soulless eyes were staring at me. He said his voice barely above a whisper. And the worst part was it had to be me. There was no one else who can use that awful technique. Only you blondie. Only you. Tiyuya said shaking her head sadly. Yea only me. Who else unconsciously unlocks such a power? Naruto whispered heartbrokenly. It's okay big sissy. Pele said glomping Naruto and clinging to his waist. I still love you. Karen was gazing at the duo with hearts in her eyes. Arhat was contemplating all that he had heard and trying to figure out how it would affect them. Tiyuya looked like she was trying with all her might not to burst out laughing. Did she call you big sissy? Tiyuya asked biting her lip. Yes she did. Naruto said with a heavy sigh. I was just making sure, she said before she burst into a fit of giggles. Moving on. Naruto deadpanned. Yes we should be. So I need you all to start sealing up everything important. After we leave I plan on sinking the island so Uzu can finally have the rest it so rightly deserves. Arhat said with authority. The three Uzumakis nodded. They each disappeared in a puff of smoke. Arhat looked down at little Pele. Well let's go and find you some food. Then we'll find you something to do while I help them seal up the remaining stuff. Pele nodded from where she was contentedly petting Cage. All the Uzumaki were standing on the ocean five miles off the coast of Uzu. Naruto was holding Pele. If the other Uzumaki had been watching Arhat's face they would have seen a single tear roll down his face as he put his hands in the ram seal and said Katsu. There was a sound explosion muffled from under the ground. The entire island gave a seismic shudder before sinking into the ocean. Arhat turned towards the distant island of Wave Country. Let's go we have a lot of ground to cover and we're gonna need to do it as fast as possible, he said with a heavy sigh. He's right. I might be able to stand here all day but the rest of you can't. Naruto said staring towards Wave Country with Pele riding on his shoulders and Cage slinking along beside him. They all began to follow. It wasn't going to be a nature hike to get to Wave Country though. It took 15 hours of solid running to reach landfall, and even with the Uzumaki stamina that was no mean feat. They all sat down heavily on the grassy knoll right off the sand. I'm going to sleep. Karen said tiredly. Wake me up in a few hours. Naruto nodded his accent to her statement. 
he cradled Pele close to him as he watched the moon's reflection across the ocean's surface. He was used to not sleeping when he was out in the open, and he was perfectly capable of going three days without sleep and still be cognizant enough to put up one hell of a fight. After three days without sleep though his body started slowing down. So it was with this in mind that it became sort of the unspoken rule that Naruto took first watch so people could get the most sleep possible. You know I find it odd that we have left Uzu. Cage murmured from beside Naruto. It was where I reached cognitive awareness and has for the most part been all I know, and now it's just gone. I know exactly what you mean. Naruto said softly. It was the first place I ever received any kindness from someone besides Gramps Hokage. Well we are sure to make waves when we get there. Cage said laying his head over his paws. Naruto nodded in agreement before gazing up at the stairs. He thought back on his training fondly. He had suffered from some of the harshest training imaginable from his sensei, but as his sensei had said. I'm not training you to be Jenin, or Chunin, or even Jonin. I'm training you to be the survivor on a battlefield of nothing but enemies. I am training you to face off against a class ninja and not even flinch. Always remember the best tools a ninja can possess are a sharp mind and a firm body. It had hurt like all hell but he had come out of it that much stronger. It wasn't going to be fun. In fact it was probably going to be downright upsetting if he thought enough about it. But he would go back to the village hidden in the leaves and he would make his father proud. Naruto was watching closely for any sign of a disturbance. He had grown weary on the way to the docks. All the other Uzumaki were with him and he found that he didn't like this fog. It had taken too long to find a boatman who would take them to the mainland. Now this damned fog was covering their path. And it was only getting thicker. Naruto sighed and tried to think logically about this, before he began to hear the clanging of metal on metal and realized that this fog wasn't natural. He signaled the others of the fight taking place in the distance. Naruto, Karen, to Yuya, go figure out what's going on. I'll bring up the rear with Pele. Arhat said picking up the little girl. The three ninjas nodded and took off through the mist at top speed. It took no time at all before they found the reason for the noise. There was a genin team guarding an old man, while two high class ninja fighting for their very souls. On one side with two kanais was the legend killer Sharingan Kakashi the copy ninja. He had a 35 million Ryu bounty in the bingo book. On the other wielding a sword as infamous as he himself was, was Zabuza Momoichi the demon of the hidden mist. To Yuya bring up a genjutsu to hide our approach from them all then you and Karen watch the kids. I'll fight Momoichi. Naruto said pulling out three cards and his staff. To Yuya unsealed her flute and begun playing softly. Karen brought out her chakra blade, she activated the two and a half feet blue blade. Naruto's staff grew to be six feet. Naruto tossed the cards at Zabuza, who had just captured Kakashi in a water prison technique. He appeared in front of Zabuza and swung his staff at the arm holding the technique. The demon released his technique and jumped back. As this was taking place Karen and Tayuya landed in between the five water clones that Zabuza had sent after the genin. In a display of supreme speed and technique the two Uzumaki destroyed the clones with their kenjutsu. More brats? Zabuza roared. Why are these kids interfering? Well we were going to join the hidden leaf village but it kind of sets a bad precedent to let a team die when we want to join the village so we're gonna have to stop you. Sorry. Naruto said getting into stance. Kakashi looked at him and then at the two girls who were between them and his genin. He got into a stance beside Naruto. The three people on the water's surface attacked in the blink of an eye. Naruto was blocking the legendary Kabikari Hucho with his staff and Kakashi was aiming a kick at Zabuza. The kick connected only for Zabuza to turn into a log which shattered under the blow. Naruto quickly threw a card at Zabuza, which blew up in his face and sent him flying across the lake's surface. Zabuza strapped Kabikari to his back and began going through hand seals for a water dragon jutsu. Kakashi was going through the same seals at the same time. Naruto put his staff away and went through the seals for water style water bullet. The three ninja finished their seals together. Two dragons rose from the depths of the lake and fought for dominance as Naruto shot balls with the size and consistency of bowling balls at Zabuza. On the shore the genin were having very different reactions to this sight. Sai was watching the battle unfold thinking how he was supposed to get word to Danzo-sama. 
Sasuke was gnashing his teeth glaring daggers at the three thinking how if only his Sharingan was activated he would have that power to use against his brother. And Sakura was gazing at the fight utterly in denial thinking that her Sasuke-kun could do it better than all three of them. Karen and Tayuya both knew that all three were holding back, though they didn't understand why Zabuza was but whatever. The fight on the water finally came to a head when Zabuza and Kakashi went for a violent water wave, and Naruto put a water wall encampment between the others in the fight. Zabuza freaked out that Kakashi was doing the hand signs at the exact same time as he was and subsequently wound up getting hit by Kakashi's technique as a result. He looked at Kakashi in terror and asked if the Sharingan could see the future. His reply was yes, and he saw Zabuza's death. Only for Zabuza to slump to the side with two senbon buried in his neck. Naruto looked up to see a hunter ninja standing on the branch of a tree. He was wearing a brown turtle neck sweater and loose fitted brown pants. He had a pair of plain sandals on his feet and a blue green colored battle kimono. Cute. He mumbled to himself, taking in the ninja's scent. He could smell chocolate and herbs. He was so lost in his thoughts that he didn't notice the ninja move however he was perfectly capable of sensing the ninja shunshin away with Zabuza's body. Well fuck. Ha deadpanned, much to Tayuya and Karen's amusement. What's wrong with you blondie? Sakura asked angrily. You not get enough of trying to show Sasuke-kun up. Um no I was upset that Zabuza got away. Naruto said confusion clear in his voice. Ha not so smart are you girly? Sasuke said with a superior smirk. Kakashi sensei checked. Zabuza's dead. Well first off there are ways to make someone look like they're dead. Asked Karen, she's a medic ninja. Secondly hunter ninjas cut off the head and burn the body the instant it comes into their possession so he wasn't one. And lastly just because I wear girls clothes doesn't make me any less of a boy you cami damned emo bastard. Perhaps we should continue this conversation in the safety of Tazuna san's house. Kakashi suggested easily trying to deter a fight. That would be a good idea. Arhat said walking up with Pele in his arms and Cage at his side. Naruto looked up at his sensei and uncle. I'll fill you in when we get to a place safe to talk sensei. Kakashi stared at the man in shock. Arhat Uzumaki. He asked just barely keeping the stutter out of his voice. Yes that is me. I only suppose we haven't met before copy ninja. Arhat said pointedly causing Kakashi to realize that he had almost given away that he was an Anbu, to people outside the village no less. He was glad for his mask. Sensei who is this? Sai asked not recognizing the old man. His name is Arhat Uzumaki. He's an S-ranked shinobi from the village of Whirlpools. Kakashi said almost reverently. The genin all gazed at the man who was passing Pele to Naruto. He didn't even look at them. He did however turn to Karen and say that she should check over Kakashi when they reached safety, and then to Tizuna. Lead the way please, he said. To be continued. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next part.